Hello there everyone, good evening. Today I'll be drawing from a story from the Great British Short Story Collection to begin and we'll have another stream after this. This is a much shorter book so I know we had quite a, a long, intense and in-depth multiple hours over the last few nights with um, Peter Pan, J.M. Barry's Peter Pan, so I thought we'd have a couple of short ones this evening, just nice easy reads, and this one is by Enid Bagnold, and I couldn't find anything at all about the actual content of the story, The Amorous Ghost, and so yeah, we'll find out before long, and it's only a few pages long, so we'll find out all about it in due time, but a little bit about Enid, Enid Bagnold. Um, she was a British writer and playwright known for the 1935 story National Velvet. I think that's her most um, popular um, book. And it says here, National Velvet is the story of a young girl who wins the Grand National Steeplechase. A highly successful film version came out in 1944 starring the young Elizabeth Taylor. However, Bagnold's work include a broad range of subject matter and style. The Squire is a novel about having a baby. Bagnold's biographer Anne Seba says that although always described as a novel, the serious effort to discover the motivations of a mother and the instincts of children leads the Squire close to the realms of documentary. The feminist weekly Tide and Time described it as a mark in feminist history as well as a fine literary feat. The Loved and Envied in 1951 is a study of approaching old age in which the protagonist Lady Ruby McLean is thought to have been based on Lady Diana Cooper. And uh, so, yeah, she's a prolific writer. She uh, Check out her Wikipedia article if you'd like to know more about her. But, yeah, prolific writer, and I imagine the story will be very interesting, which we'll find out momentarily. As always, to support the channel, consider... Like the video, subscribe to the channel if you enjoy it, share the show with your friends and also I think um, we're nearly, we're very close to 5,000 subscribers and the reading of Boy by Roald Dahl, I don't think we're quite going to get there for Sunday so I'm going to push it forward one more Sunday, so Sunday the 27th which will actually be the day before my birthday if any of you are interested so that will be a double celebration. 5,000 subscribers and also my 39th birthday so if you're interested in that set a reminder for 8 p.m sunday the 27th but for now enough of the introductions the amorous ghost by enid bagnold it was five o'clock on a summer morning the birds who had woken at three had long scattered about their duties the white, plain house, blinkered and green-shuttered, stood four square to its soaking lawns, and up and down on the grass his snow-boots, planting dark bolts on the grey dew, walked the owner. His hair was uncombed, he wore his pyjamas and an overcoat, and at every turn, at the end of the lawn, he looked up at a certain window, that of his own and his wife's bedroom, where, as on every other window on the long front, the green shutters lay neatly back against the wall, and the cream curtains hung down in heavy folds. The owner of the house, strangely and uncomfortably on his lawns, instead of in, in his bed, rubbed his chilly hands and continued his tramp. He had no watch on his wrist, but when the stable clock struck six, he entered the house and, passing through the still hall, he went up to his bathroom. The water was lukewarm in the taps from the night before, and he took a bath. As he left the bathroom for his dressing room, he heard the stirring of the first housemaid in the living room below, and at seven o'clock ra he rang for his butler to lay out his clothes. At, at the same as the same thing had happened the day before, the butler was half prepared for the bell, yawning and incensed, but ready dressed. Good morning, said Mr. Templeton rather suddenly. It was a greeting which he never gave, but he wished to try the quality of his voice. Finding it steady, he went on and gave an order for a melon from the greenhouse. For breakfast, he had very little appetite, and when he had finished the melon, he unfolded the newspaper. The door of the dining-room opened, and the parlour-maid and housemaid came in and gave him their notice. 
A month from today, sir, repeated the parlour-maid to bridge the silence that followed. It's nothing to do with me, he said in a low voice. Your mistress is coming home tonight. You must tell her of these things. They left the room. What's the matter with those girls? said Mr. Templeton to the butler who came in. They haven't spoken to me, sir, said the butler, untruly, but I gather there has been an upset. "'Because I chose to get up early on a summer morning?' asked Mr. Templeton, with an effort. "'Yes, sir, and there were other reasons. Which were?' "'The housemaid,' said the butler, with detachment, as though he were speaking of the movements of a fly, "'has found your bedroom, sir, strewn with clothes.' "'With my clothes?' said Mr. Templeton. "'No, sir.' Mr. Templeton sat down. "'A nightgown?' he said weakly, as though appealing for human understanding." "'Yes, sir. More than one. Two, sir. Good God!' said Mr. Templeton, and walked to the window, whistling shakily. The butler cleared the table quietly and left the room. "'There's no question about it,' said Mr. Templeton under his breath. "'She was undressing, behind the chair.' After breakfast he walked down his two fields and through a wood, with the idea of talking to Mr. George Casson. But George had gone to London for the day, and Mr. Templeton, faced with the polish on the front door, the polish on the parlour-maid, and the sober look on the morning post folded on the table, felt that it was as, as well that he had not, after all, to confide his incredible story. He walked back again, steadied by the air and exercise. "'I'll telephone to Hetty,' he decided, "'and make sure that she is coming to-night.' He rang up his wife, told her that he was well, that all was well, and heard with satisfaction that she was coming down that night after her dinner party, catching the 11.30, arriving at 12.15 at the station. Hello, Jill. I'm doing very well, thanks. Hope you are too. Hello there, everyone, coming in. There is no train before at all, she said. I sent round to the station to see, and owing to the strike, they run none between 7.15 and 11.30. Then I'll send a car to the station, and you'll be here at half-past twelve. I may be in bed as I'm tired. You're not ill? No, I've had a bad night. It was not until the afternoon, after a good luncheon and a whisky and soda, that Mr. Templeton went up to his bedroom to have a look at it. The, the cream curtains hung lightly blowing in the window. By the fireplace stood a high wing grandfather chair, upholstered in patterned rep. Opposite the chair and the fireplace was the double bed, in one side of which Mr. Templeton had lain working at his papers the night before. He walked up to his chair, put his hands in his pockets, and stood looking down at it. Then he crossed to the chest of drawers and drew out a drawer. On the right-hand side were Hetty's vests and chemises, neatly pressed and folded. On the left side was a pile, folded but not pressed, of Hetty's nightgowns. Mr. Templeton noticed, noted the crumples and creases of the silk. "'Evidence, evidence,' he said, walking to the window, "'that something happened in this room after I left it this morning. "'The maids believe they found a strange woman's nightgowns crumpled on the floor.' "'As a matter of fact, they are Hetty's nightgowns. "'I suppose a doctor would say I'd done it myself in a trance. Two nights ago,' he thought, looking again at the bed, "'it seemed a week. "'The night before last, as he lay working, "'propped up on pillows and cushions "'and his papers spread over the bed, "'he had glanced up, absorbed, "'at two o'clock in the morning, "'and traced the pattern on the grandfather chair "'as it stood facing the empty grate "'with its back towards him, "'just as he had left it when he had got into bed.' It was then that he had seen the two hands hanging idly over the back of the chair, and a cold fear wandered down his spine. He sat without moving and watched the hands. <laughs> hey, Sammy. Hello there. Sammy's daughter. Hi, guys. I hope you're good. Ten minutes passed, and the hands were withdrawn quickly as though the occupant of the chair had silently changed its position. Still he watched, propped, stiffening on his pillows, and as time went on he fought the impression down. Tired, he said. One's read of it, the brain reflecting something. His heart quietened, and cautiously he settled himself a little lower and tried to sleep. 
He did not dare straighten the, the litter of papers around him, but with the light on he lay there till the dawn lit the yellow paint on the wall. At five he got up, sleepless, his eyes still on the back of the grandfather chair, and without his dressing gown or slippers he left the room. In the hall he found an overcoat and his warm snow boots behind a chest, and on bolting the front door he tramped the lawn in the dew. On the second night, last night, he had worked as before. So completely had he convinced himself after a day of fresh air that his previous night's experience had been the result of his own imagination, his eyesight and his mind hallucinated by his work, that he had not even remembered, as he had meant to do, to turn the grandfather chair with its seat towards him. Now, as he worked in bed, he glanced from time to time at its patterned and concealing back, and wished vaguely that he had thought to turn it round. He had not worked more than two hours before he knew that there was something going on, on the chair, or in the chair. Hello there, stitch, loving angel lover, welcome. Who's there? he called. The slight movement he had heard ceased for a moment, then began again. For a second he thought he saw a hand shoot out at the side, and once he could have sworn he saw the tip of, of a mound of fair hair showing over the top. There was a sound of scuffling in the chair, and some object flew out and landed with a bump on the floor below the field of his vision. Five minutes went by, and after a fresh scuffle, a hand shot up and laid a bundle white and stiff, with what seemed a small arm hanging on the back of the chair. Mr. Templeton had had two bad nights and a great many hours of emotion. When he grasped that the object was a pair of stays with a suspender swinging from them, something bumped unevenly in his heart. A million black motes, like a cloud of flies, swam in his eyeballs. He fainted. He woke up and the room was dark. The light was off and he felt a little sick. Turning in bed to find comfort for his body, he remembered that he had been in the middle of a crisis of fear. He looked about him in the dark and saw again the dawn of the curtains. Then he heard a chink by the washstand several feet nearer to his bed than the grandfather chair. He was not alone. The thing was still in the room. By the faint light from the curtains he could just see that his visitor was by the washstand. There was a gentle clinking of china and a sound of water, and dimly he could see a woman standing. Undressing, he said to himself, washing. His gorge rose at the thought that came to him. Was it possible that the woman was coming to bed? It was that thought that had driven him with a wild rush from the room and sent him marching for a second time up and down his grey and dewy lawns. And now, thought Mr. Templeton, as he stood in the neat bedroom in the afternoon light and looked around him, Hetty's got to believe in the unfaithful or the supernatural. He crossed to the grandfather chair and, taking it in his two hands, was about to push it onto the landing, but he paused. I'll leave it where it is, tonight, he thought and go to bed as usual for both our sakes i must find out something more about this spending the rest of the afternoon out of doors he played golf after the tea and eating a very light dinner he went to bed his head ached badly from lack of sleep but he was pleased to notice that his heart beat steadily he, he took a couple of aspirin tablets to ease his head and with a light novel settled himself down in bed to read and watch Hetty would arrive at half-past twelve, and the butler was waiting up to let her in. Sandwiches, nicely covered from the air, were placed ready for her, on a tray in a corner of the bedroom. It was now eleven. He had an hour and a half to wait. She may come at any time, he said, thinking of his visitor. He had turned the grandfather chair towards him, so that he could see the seat. Quarter of an hour went by, and his head throbbed so violently that he put the book on his knees and altered the lights, turned out the brilliant reading lamp, switched on the light which illuminated the large face of the clock over the mantelpiece, so that he sat in shadow. Five minutes later, he was asleep. <laughs> Hello there, the little story lady. Thank you. He lay with his face buried in a pillow, the pain still drumming in his head, aware of his headache even at the bottom of his sleep. Dimly he heard his wife arrive, and murmured a hope to himself that she would not wake him. 
A slight movement rustled around him as she entered the room and undressed, but his pain was so bad that he could not bring himself to give a sign of life, and soon, while he clung to his half-sleep, he felt the bedclothes gently lifted and heard her slip in beside him. Feeling chilly, he drew his blanket close around him. It was as though a draught was blowing about him in the bed, dispelling the midst of sleep and bringing him to himself. He felt a touch of remorse at his lack of welcome, and putting out his hand he sought his wife's, his wife's beneath the sheet. Finding her wrist, his fingers closed round it. She too was cold, strange, icy, and from her stillness and silence she appeared to be asleep. A cold drive from the station, he thought, and held her wrist to warm it as he dozed again. "'She is positively chilling the bed,' he murmured to himself. "'He was awakened by a roar beneath the window "'and the sweep of a light across the wall of the room. "'With amazement he heard the bolt shoot back across the front door. "'On the illuminated face of the clock over the fireplace "'he saw the hand standing at twenty-seven minutes past twelve. "'Then Mr. Templeton, still gripping the wrist beside him, "'heard his wife's clear voice in the hall below.' The End The Amorous Ghost, it appears. So, yes, as I said, a very short one this evening compared to our pair of long marathons for um, J.M. Barry. But I have another story for you, a um, an Aldous Huxley number. So I will shut down this stream. I'll say goodbye, shut down the stream. And if you hang around on the channel or just on YouTube, for uh, yeah, l less than five minutes I'll be back and the second story is around a similar length. So yeah, if you're here and watching, um, yeah, it'd be good if you could hang around and join me for the next one. I suppose I should tell you what it is, shouldn't I? If you're interested, it's got a funny name and a funny um, content, I'd imagine. It's called, You Pompous Gave Splendor to Art by Numbers. And as always, Aldous Huxley, never fails to please and write well so yeah i'll be back in about five minutes with another stream and we'll do it all over again so guys i'll see you in a little while uh, yeah i hope you can join and if not i'll see you next time bye guys <laughs>